Welcome everyone to Iris Biotech's 11th online workshop. True to our slogan, Empowering Peptide Innovation, we are keen on knowledge exchange and getting in contact with scientists all over the world. Therefore, we started this workshop series two years ago. Today, our focus is on click chemistry in the context of automated peptide synthesis. Our guest speaker, Dr. Quibria Guthrie, of the well-known laboratory instrumentation specialist CEM, will present a fascinating case study about automate, automation of peptide modifications, and in particular, the click chemistry. My name is Raimund Meyer. I am working as a COO at Iris Biotech, and today I will guide you through this workshop. If you wish to announce your participation on social media, please feel free to use the hashtag Iris Workshop Series, which is also displayed right now in the Microsoft Teams chat. As always, I would like to begin with some technical guidelines. To ensure the best possible audio and video quality, all participants are automatically muted and your video camera is switched off. This live event is recorded. Thus, if you enter late or miss anything, please check on the bottom left side of your team screen if you are watching the recording or if you are live, which is shown by the red broadcasting symbol. You have the possibility to pause the video, rewind or jump back to the live session. In addition, the recording of the workshop will be uploaded on our homepage afterwards. Questions can be submitted by using the Q&A chat of Teams. You can enter your name or submit your questions anonymously. Initially, your questions are just visible for the organizers and will then be published to the audience. So don't worry if your submitted questions does, uh, question does not appear on the chat screen immediately. If you have any technical queries, you can also submit them in the Q&A chat. Our technical assistant will then connect with you and try to solve the problem. I would now like to quickly give you an overview on today's agenda. We will start with a short company and topic introduction by our Chief Scientific Officer, Thomas Bruckdorfer. Afterwards, our external speaker, Quibria Guthrie, will present to you the possibilities in automated peptide modification. As mentioned, questions will be collected throughout all talks in the Q&A chat and are forwarded to the speakers. But of course, you can also get in contact via email or phone call after the workshop. By the way, if you accidentally close your Microsoft Teams window, don't panic. The workshop is also available as recording and you won't miss anything. Just re-log in and view the recording. You can then also play this recording at increased speed until you catch up with the live event again. After this technical intro, let's continue with the first agenda point, a short introduction to our company, Iris Biotech, by our CSO, Thomas Bruckdorfer. Thomas studied chemistry and obtained his PhD degree at the University of Erlangen. He broadened his education by an MBA study in management and distribution of complex technical projects and systems. And he's a co-owner of Iris Biotech since 2002, serving as CSO and Vice President of Business Development. Thomas, thank you for your time. Please go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Raymond, uh, for your kind introduction and also a very warm welcome from my side to this workshop. Um, with the following slides, I want to give you a brief introduction to our company, Iris Biotech, as well as to the topic, which is today click chemistry in the context of automated uh, peptide synthesis. Iris Biotech has been founded uh, 22 years ago in 2001. And due to the growing demand of uh, customized products, we have started the production facility, Iris Biotech Laboratories, about 10 years ago in 2013, which is located in Wilstedt, which is in the southwest of Germany, close to Strasbourg. Um, our portfolio consists of more than 6,000 products, which are produced in our own laboratories or by some selected uh, manufacturing partners. We select actually very carefully with whom we work, which results in a very low complaint rate, which is consistently below 0.5% only. In 
2021, we refreshed our whole corporate layout with new logo, new design and marketing. We, oh, sorry, this is, we need to go to this slide here. Yeah, we are located in Mark Redritz, which is in Bavaria in Germany, close to the border to the Czech Republic. It is a rural area in the mountains of uh, Northeast Bavaria, which is actually a hotspot of technology driven small and middle sized companies uh, just like us. And here is a picture of our company building in which we moved in in 2018. We understand ourselves as a qualified supplier and competent consultant to the biotech and pharmaceutical industry and want to support and accompany our clients during design and execution of their projects, no matter where it is, from early research through to pilot phase or even uh, commercial productions. We are a market leader in unusual amino acids and therefore our main markets are reagents and building blocks for the design of peptides, including various modifications. Our section drug delivery contains polymers like packs and polyamino acids, which are used in, uh, for example, in today very well known LNPs, so-called lipidated nanoparticles used in the formulation of latest mRNA vaccines. All is rounded up by our custom synthesis service division. Click chemistry always played an important, important role, and this brings me also to the topic of today. Last year, in 2022, the Nobel Prize has been awarded to Bertuzzi, Sharpless and Metal. Uh, a very elegant and universally applicable methodology to simply connect uh, two molecules to each other. The one is carrying a linear alkyne and the other, the other one an acido function. And in the presence of stoichiometric amounts of copper, both functions undergo a Diels-Alder reaction forming a stable triazole. So in the following years, this method further has developed uh, to the strain promoted cycle addition and the inverse electron demand cycle additions. Both methods actually don't require any catalysis of copper anymore, which is a major advantage using this methodology in any kinds of bioconjugation. So due to our slogan, empowering peptide innovation, we are keen to interact with inventors and market leaders of sophisticated technologies in order to make products and technologies accessible to the broad audience uh, of our market. This is also the reason for starting this uh, webinar series, having an information platform available, which explains latest technologies and describes benefits and possibilities of latest inventions and technologies and how they can be used by everyone. And this brings us automatically to, topic, to the topic of today's webinar. Um, so here we are uh, introducing then uh, uh, QPR Guthrie um, from CEM, uh, which is a market leader in uh, instrumentation for peptide synthesis. And I'm thrilled to learn more about uh, what she can tell us uh, in this context. Thank you, Raymond. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for giving this introduction. So yeah, let's now really go on with our highlight and switch to the external guest speaker, Quibria Guthrie. Quibria grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where she also obtained her Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Wisconsin, majoring in chemistry with a concentration in biochemistry. Her love for research started as she participated in the Ronald McNair Research Scholar Program under the leadership of Professor Xiaowa Peng. She worked on the synthesis of kinone methyl precursors for anti-cancer product strategies. Quibria obtained her PhD in chemistry in 2021 from North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Under the leadership of Professor Caroline Pruhl, she worked on the synthesis and, and analysis of n aryl amino acids for application in bioconjugation reactions. After completing her graduate program, she became a research scientist in the life science division at CEM Corporation, where she continues to work on peptide synthesis methodology and new synthesis instrumentation. Quibria, it's a great pleasure to host you as our guest speaker 
the stage is yours. We're looking forward to hearing about your research. And for the audience, please post your questions by using the Q&A chat. Thank you for that introduction, um, and I'm very excited to be able to talk about peptide modifications in the context of automation and talking about our recent um, advances in utilizing our instrumentation to access click chemistry products. Um, and so um, I want to thank Iris Biotech for the opportunity to be able to talk today um, and also want to point out that you may see the Iris Biotech throughout uh, my presentation, and that's just to highlight reagents that you can find on Iris Biotech's website um, if you are interested um, in those um, molecules. And so, Oh, there we go. I um, just want to give an introduction um, in terms of what will be covered in um, this presentation. First, starting off with an introduction, um, talking about peptide therapeutics, um, talking about methods and ways to synthesize peptides, and then moving forward to CEM and how we are involved um, in that space. All right, um, the next uh, topic will be talking about different modifications. Peptides can be modified in many different ways and have many different downstream effects. And so I want to just talk about a few examples of uh, modifications. Then I'll dive into click chemistry. Um, we have not done click chemistry previously on our automated system, so we uh, wanted to uh, start exploring that and I'll uh, be able to share what we've been able to achieve so far. And then I will um, end with some conclusions and future directions um, from there. And so we can get started with the introduction. And so there are a number of peptides moving through the drug discovery pipeline currently, and there are many peptides that are already on the market. In terms of um, space, where you see peptide drugs, they cover a large amount of space within medicine and therapeutic needs. Um, a really popular peptide right now um, is um, semaglutide, as it has been seen to have significant effects on weight loss. And so um, I just have a few examples of some peptide therapeutics drawn out and just wanted to highlight the fact that not only do these peptides have natural um, amino acids in them, they also have um, unnatural peptide modifications that are really crucial for their um, therapeutic action. And so why are we interested in peptide therapeutics? Um, peptides sit in a nice space between um, the other molecules that are in um, our therapeutic uh, space. On one side, we have small molecules. Um, they are great because they have um, bioavailability. Um, they are able to penetrate cells. Um, we're able to upscale um, and synthesize a lot of this material um, and we're able to manufacture these at low cost. Um, they have metabolic stability as they are unnatural to our bodies, um, so it takes a while to be able to break those down, allowing for them to stay in your systems for extended um, amounts of time. On the other side, uh, we have biologics, and so you can think of things like antibodies. Um, they look very similar to things that um, we already have in our bodies. Um, and because of that, we are able to see that they have high potency, high selectivity. And because it has that um, high selectivity, you can see that they also have um, low toxicity. And so peptides are in the middle in terms of molecular uh, weight. Um, and you may be thinking, well, we already have peptides in our bodies. How can they be used for therapeutics? Um, and that's where the peptide modifications and functionalizations and looking into peptidin mimetics, which are just modified um, peptides, um, as that is how we are able to uh, have the different properties of both sides of our, our therapeutic space, where we have the stability and bioavailability properties of small molecules, but then we also have the selectivity of biologics. 
And so um, it is really important to be able to look into um, different ways to be able to modify peptides. We've seen a huge boom in the research space uh, where people are working on peptides and finding new ways to make modifications um, to peptides. And so there are a few different ways that you can make peptides. Um, one way is to do recombinant synthesis, so taking advantage of biology to have access to peptides. Um, we're proof that peptides um, our biology can make peptides very well. Um, so it has the ability to create uh, long peptides with no insertions and deletion impurities. However, um, because it is biology, um, it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time um, to be able to get appreciable amount of peptide. Um, and there is little to no access to non-standard uh, amino, amino acids. Another approach to peptide synthesis um, is solution phase synthesis. Um, with this method, you do have access to non-natural amino acids. Um, you're able to get high reactive efficiency. You're able to push these reactions um, forward, um, being able to upscale. Uh, however, um, if you've ever done round bottom chemistry, you know that it can be very la um, labor and time intensive. Um, there's usually a workup and purification step after every single reaction or every single coupling. Um, and that just takes um, time as any time you want to elongate um, your um, peptide, you do have to do those extra steps. And there is some synthetic mod uh, optimization that is required. And then that leads us to solid phase synthesis. Um, that is the method um, that is well, uh, well, uh, mostly used today. Um, and it has a lot of strengths where we're having access to these unnatural amino acids. We are able to have high reactive efficiencies like the solution phase. Um, because our peptides are linked to the solid supports, uh, we're able to add reagents. And once that reaction is done, we can drain away those reagents and keep our peptides still attached to beads. And because we're able to do that process, it leads to uh, one workup and one purification that's required um, for these um, for this method. And also because of the ease of being able to add reagents, strain reagents, and keep the reaction going, it allows for this process to be automated. Um, but because there is synthesis that is taking place, um, optimization may be uh, required. Not every sequence um, is easy to make, um, so there may be um, some things to keep in mind um, in terms of optimization. And that leads me into introducing CEM. So CEM is a leading provider in laboratory microwave systems. Uh, we've been in business for 45 years now, um, designing and manufacturing different uh, microwave instrumentation. And our headquarters is here in Charlotte, North Carolina in the United States. And within our headquarters, we have R&D, manufacturing, application, sales, service. So we're all housed um, in this under the same roof, which is really great because that really does allow for there to be um, good opportunities to be able to collaborate um, and being able to make advances and being able to see those changes in real time. Um, we have offices all over the world. We have some in, we have one in Germany, the UK, France, Italy, Japan, Singapore, um, and we have a global dealer network um, with more than 70 countries. So CEM is seen all over the world and we have been doing this for a while. And so within CEM, we have our life science division. So this is where our peptide synthesizers live. Um, the life science division is a team of more than 15 PhDs, masters and bachelor level chemists. And we have instrumentation that covers many different applications, proteomics, in-situ hybridization, general synthesis, peptide synthesis, as well as purification. And so um, it's really important to us to be able to continue to find ways that we can um, increase the effectiveness and um, efficiency of being able to make peptides and just uh, thinking about their overall workflow um, as well. 
And so um, CEM has a few different lines of peptide synthesizers. We have parallel uh, synthesizers where we are able to make many different peptides at one time. And then we have our line of microwave synthesizers where it takes advantage of microwaves to be able to get to your desired um, peptide product uh, quickly and being able to get really good high crude purities. And so I want to introduce the peptide synthesizers um, that uh, is basically going to be the show in terms of the ones used um, as we started to look into click chemistry. The first instrument is going to be the Multipep 2 is a parallel peptide synthesizer. Uh, what's great about it is the fact that it has exchangeable workspaces. What, so whether you are trying to make peptides at very small scale, make large libraries, or being able to upscale, you can do all of that on the Multipep 2. Um, you have the ability to not only do resin-based synthesis, but you can also do cellulose, um, so very small scale. And the synthesis scale range um, is from 4 nanomoles up until about 300 micromoles. And so technically you can make up to 2,400 peptides on cellulose at one time with the Multipep 2 and can make up to 384 peptides on resin. Um, with this peptide synthesizer, it is doing FMOC um, solid phase peptide synthesis and the main uh, chemistry that it's used is using HBTU and DIA coupling reagents. On the other side, we have the Liberty Blue, um, which is a microwave peptide synthesizer. It is resin-based synthesis. Um, you're able to get pretty high scales on the, um, on the Liberty as we can go from 0.005 to 5 millimoles. Um, and although we are making one peptide at a time, um, you do have the ability to have a resin loader so that you can queue up multiple runs so you are able to keep your synthesizer going and continuing to make um, peptides even if you're not able to be there to change out your resin. Um, this also does um, FMOC uh, solid phase synthesis procedures. Um, the coupling times are about four minutes. So this includes deprotections. This includes coupling as well as washing. So very fast um, coupling times. You can get a 10 mer um, peptide that will probably take days if you're going to do this manually um, in about an hour. And the coupling approach for this instrument takes advantage of Oxima and DIC. And so um, with that being said, uh, we now can see that peptide therapeutics are growing and it's really important to be able to uh, get to our desired products. Um, CEM has products to be able to do so. And so I now want to just talk about a few different peptide modifications um, to think about um, when we're thinking uh, how can we uh, make changes to peptides that could be beneficial in, um, in terms of being used for therapeutics. All right, so the four modifications that I'm going to talk about right now, um, we're all done taking advantage of our microwave synthesizer. And so the first one I want to talk about is going to be hindered amino acids. Um, this is something that has seen has been seen to um, really influence uh, in terms of secondary structure of peptides that can be very crucial for their activity. Um, but when it comes to hindered amino acids, you may think that this might be tricky to be able to incorporate um, into a peptide chain. So we'll talk about how to do so, taking advantage of our microwave synthesizer. Um, another modification um, that uh, is seen in uh, relevant peptides is disulfide bridging. So it takes advantage of a natural uh, amino acid being able to link two of those together to be able to have macrocyclization. Um, also with this, it helps with being able to have your peptide in conformed um, fashion and that can lead to downstream um, effects in terms of um, potential therapeutic activity. And so this is using a natural amino acid to be able to do a modification. There are examples of taking advantage of unnatural building blocks to be able to um, also stabilize secondary structure and hydrocarbon is a um, hydrocarbon stapling is an example of um, that. 
And then I also want to talk about a peptidome mimetic um, peptoids um, as although they look very similar to peptides, they have seen to have many um, beneficial effects um, now that we have now moved the side chain onto the nitrogen. We have a lot of side chain variability available and that has been seen to be very important um, in their potential use for therapeutics. So, Hindered amino, uh, hindered amino acid incorporation. So AIB is one that um, has been seen. It's actually a residue that is in semaglutide, um, and it has been shown to uh, help with inducing alpha helical formation. And another example of a hindered amino acid is in methylated amino acids. In this case, we have in methylated um, alanine. And so it has been seen to help with protease resistance um, again, kind of with the idea of this doesn't look exactly like a peptide, um, so it has a little bit more um, stability within the body as it takes a lot, uh, a little bit more time to be able to break down um, things that don't ne necessarily look like um, things exactly in the body. And then also, um, it has been seen to alter secondary structure as well. And so um, the concern here is uh, being able to incorporate these amino acids even though they are bulky. And so um, we were able to uh, look at this and find uh, methods to be able to incorporate these. And so if we wanted to incorporate a hindered amino acid onto a natural amino acid um, that's not necessarily bulky, um, you can take advantage of our single couplings 90 degrees at two minutes. If you wanted to put two bulky amino acids one um, next to each other, you can do so. All you have to do is double couple and elongate the coupling just by a few more minutes. And if you wanted to put a natural amino acid after you've had a hindered amino acid, you also have access to that, um, just taking advantage of double coupling. And so, um, we just have a few examples of um, how that can work. And so putting two AIBs next to each other, uh, we're able to get high crew purities, 95% in under two hours. And in the case of N-methylated alanine, we're also able to incorporate two of those back to back, um, getting about a crew purity of 86%. Um, and again, having access to, to that in two hours. So um, that is really nice to be able to have access to these hindered amino acids within sequences um, and being able to get to those um, products um, relatively quickly. Disulfide bridging. Um, oxytocin is an example of a peptide that has a disulfide bond, which is um, there with the star. Um, it has been seen, um, these disulfides, in prevalent biological compounds. Um, it, helps sec uh, stabilize secondary structure because it has this um, stability. It allows for there to be, to be uh, protease resistance, as well as the fact that now it is constrained, um, it has a better uh, ability to be able to find its target um, and being able to bind to that target. And so um, to be able to do these disulfide bridging on solid support, it is going to be important to be able to um, get access to the side chains, um, but not having access to other side chains. So it is important to have an orthogonal protecting group on the cysteines that are required for disulfides. Um, and we wanna make sure that uh, this is orthogonal to other protecting groups that are potentially on different amino acids. But then also we wanna make sure that we're not cleaving um, our peptides off of solid support prematurely. And so an example of an orthogonal protected cysteine is taking advantage of MMT um, protecting group. And you're able to cleave off MMT with small percentages of TFA, only about 2%. Um, and that allows for you to have access to your um, thions. And then um, with a uh, reagent called in uh, chlorosuccidamide, you're able to uh, actually form this disulfide bridge, um, and this does not affect any other side chain on um, your amino or on your peptide chain. And then you also don't have to worry about cleavage um, off of solid support. And with that, you're able to get compounds such as oxytocin in high crew purity. We have it as 69% crew purity. And we're able to synthesize the peptide as well as being able to do that disulfide bridge um, in under three hours. 
And then another example of being able to, um, to stabilize secondary structures is um, taking advantage of a hydrocarbon stapling, uh, which is shown here. And this has been shown and used to stabilize alpha helical um, structures. Um, because of this, it helps with stability and has a longer half-life in serums. And um, it has been shown in the literature Alpheal chains um, within peptides can help with um, cell permeability of peptides. And so to be able to do this hydrocarbon stapling, it is required to have a unnatural um, building block. It requires to have these alkene um, containing um, side chains, and we're able to incorporate two of those. We incorporate those using standard uh, coupling conditions that we do on the Liberty Blue. And then from there, we're able to use Grubbs Catalyst um, to be able to, all of this on solid support to do a ring coat closing metastasis reaction, um, which allows for you to form that um, stapled product. And so this is just an example of um, doing a hydrocarbon uh, stapling, and we were able to get this um, product um, in 80% crude purity in under four hours. And again, this is making this peptide as well as doing um, the hydrocarbon stapling. And um, the last modification I want to talk about before we get into click chemistry um, is going to be peptoids. And so peptides, um, they normally have our side chain um, on this alpha carbon. And in the case of peptoids, they're actually the side chain is not on that carbon anymore. It is on the nitrogen. And so um, with this, it has access to some pretty cool, unique secondary structure that are not seen in peptides. Um, it also allows for proteus resistance, again, because it doesn't look exactly like a natural peptide. Um, and you can take advantage of a lot of different side chain diversity on peptoids to be able to access um, good target affinity as well as potency. And so how to get access to peptoids, it is a two-step process. Um, the first step is to do a bromoacetylation uh, with bromoacetic acid. And then from there, you're able to do a displacement of that bromide uh, with an amine. Because there are so many commercially available amines, that allows for you to have a lot of different diversity on the side chain, um, again, uh, which can be useful for um, target affinity. Um, and potency. And so this process just continues over and over. You do bromoacetylation, displacement, and you continue to do that over. Um, it also has been shown that hybrids of peptides and peptoids have been really useful in the context of therapeutics as you have your biological um, peptides that are recognized by the body, but then you also have those peptoids, so the unnatural portion um, to help with being able to stay in, in the body longer and being able to, to target new things that you weren't able to with natural peptides. And so um, we just have an example of a peptide peptoid hybrid um, where you're able to get access to this in 81% um, crude purity in under um, two hours. And so these are just a few different modifications, a few different ways to think about um, things that you can change about peptides that can have downstream effects for um, applications and um, more particular um, in the realm of therapeutics. And so that was kind of an introduction into peptide modifications and why they um, are important and a few examples of those. Um, now I want to talk about our recent work with click chemistry. Um, again, we have not done click chemistry before this time. Um, so it's, we thought it was a good opportunity to start exploring um, the limitations and uh, what we can do with click chemistry. And so, um, like I said before, um, click chemistry um, was recently recognized because of uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, Sh Dr. Sharp, Liz, Medell, and Bertozzi was rewarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2022 because of their work in click chemistry. Um, in terms of functional groups, this reaction uh, takes place with an alkyne as well as an azide. Um, in the traditional uh, 
method to be able to do click chemistry. It requires a source of copper to be able to get this triazole um, product. And so the functional groups themselves for um, this click chemistry to happen um, are orthogonal and biostable um, functional groups, as well as the click product that is um, produced um, from this reaction. And so um, if you're thinking about doing click chemistry in a biological setting, um, the copper may not be an ideal uh, reaction condition to do so. And that's when um, that strain promoted uh, reaction became really, really useful um, as you no longer need to use copper to have access to these click products. And that's when you really seen a boom of being able to see this chemistry used across a large um, field in terms of uh, research. And so um, that leads into um, how did we want to uh, design an experiment to see if we're able to get access to not only incorporating these unnatural building blocks into our peptides, but can we do click chemistry taking advantage of our synthesizers? And so uh, first thing I thought about was being able to take advantage of our multi-pep parallel uh, synthesizer if we're able to make more than one peptide at once, which allows for me to explore more than one variable at one time. Um, just a note, the peptide sequences that were used were random peptide um, sequences used from a generator. And there's some pros and cons to that. Um, a pro is you're able to see uh, really the um, versatility of the chemistry. Um, and there are a lot of different functional groups that are normally um, seen in a library with generated peptides, but also um, these are randomly generated. It's not really taking into account any difficulties or uh, other factors into play when it's generating these sequences. So we'll see how um, that is important. So in terms of sequence length, that's one variable. We have some shorter peptides where there's five mers. We have some 10 mers um, for uh, four of those. Um, each of those. And then the location of the functional group. Um, is it important if it's on the end terminus? Can we have these functional groups in the middle of the sequence? Um, so I wanted to test that out as well. And then also functional group. Um, which functional group is on the peptide? Is it the alkyne or is it the A side? And so I wanted to test both of those variables. And so the method um, to be able to incorporate these um, monomers. Um, I use traditional um, conditions, the same conditions that I use to couple on all the other amino acids within this um, sequence. Did FMACD protections twice um, and did double couplings um, for 15 minutes um, as well, using four equivalents of our coupling reagents and our amino acids. And we repeated that until we got to our desired peptide um, chain. And so what we were able to see is um, looking at those five MERS, uh, we were able to get high crude purity in um, most cases for uh, these peptides, where in all cases, the major product that was observed using UPLC was our desired peptide. And so we've seen for the alkynes that were able to get high crude purity, whether it's at the end terminus of the peptide or in the middle of the peptide. And same went for the azides, whether it was on the end terminus or the middle, our major product um, was our desired product. It was noticed when looking at the UPOC data for our 10 MERS, the crude purities were really relatively low. We had really messy chromatograms. Um, in some cases, I did not see my desired mass. Um, this could be sequence dependent um, issues. Um, some more synth synthetic optimization um, is going to be required. But I was still very um, encouraged by the fact that we were able to get access to these smaller peptides and able to get some um, good data with varying um, side chains um in different environments of those um, unnatural building blocks. And so I wanted to see if I could get access to maybe some of those longer peptides taking advantage of microwave synthesis. Um, and so 
moved over to the Liberty Blue, uh, where we're able to, again, do couplings in as little as four minutes, um, taking advantage of really quick um, 90 degree one minute cup um, deprotections and then two minute couplings. Um, and these unnatural monomers were coupled on using the same conditions as the natural amino acids, um, where we're using 5, 10, uh, 5 equivalency um, of Oxima DIC and amino acid, uh, respectively. And so I just took a few of the peptides that were in the larger library that was done on the Matupep um, and tried them on the Liberty. And what we were able to see is um, even with the 10 merge, we do have access to those, which was really great to see. Um, and we were able to get our desired products at high crude purities, whether again, the alkyne was in the middle of the sequence or at the end, um, or if we're using longer peptide sequences shown at the bottom. And same way for the azide, we were able to get um, hide crew purity for those peptides containing the azide. This trace at the bottom is just a representative um, trace. Um, in this case, it is our 10 um, mer peptide when an azide in the middle of the sequence. And we're able to get really good um, crew purity um, with the first try um, being able to incorporate these unnatural building blocks. And so um, the next step is to see, can we do click chemistry um, on the systems? Um, and so there are a few things I like to keep in mind when thinking about new chemistry, and this is just kind of in general, um, on an automated synthesizer. One, could, this reag could these reagents harm the instrument? Um, these are really expensive um, equipment, and um, are the reagents corrosive? Are they strong bases or acids? Um, could it damage valves, um, lines, things like that within the system? Um, it is important to, to keep that in mind um, when thinking about doing, a, doing chemistry on an automated system. Second thing, solubility of your reagents. Are your reagents soluble um, in the solvent um, choice? that you have. Um, when you mix these things together, are they still soluble? Um, those things are really important um, because you don't want to have things crashing out um, on lines within um, the instrument. Another consideration is stability of your reagents. Can they stay at room temperature for extended amounts of time um, dissolved in stock solutions? Um, those are things to um, consider as well. And scalability, can you scale up? Can you scale down? Um, do you have the ability um, to do so? That can also be um, important, um, especially if you want to go from, let's say, libraries to you find a target and you want to be able to um, upscale that. It, it may be important um, to think about scalability there um, with your new chemistry. And so um, I do want to bring light uh, to I did want to bring light to this because I actually did have a, a case where I did have to think about solubility of my reagents. Um, and so above are my reagents required for my click chemistry, whether that um, I'm clicking onto an azide um, using our alkene here, or we're doing the opposite where we have our azide coupling onto an alkyne. And so um, traditionally we use DMF for solid phase synthesis. I noticed that not all of my reagents were going into solution readily in DMF. Um, our base DIA did, but when it came to the biotin um, containing small molecules, they were not very soluble in DMF. Tried a few different solvents. DMSO seemed to work very, very well for my copper as well as my biotin containing peptides. Um, but my DIA was not completely soluble in um, DMSO. And so that led to me exploring maybe mixtures of solvents, so trying DMSO and DMF. And that worked really, really well, especially for the Machipep, doing it at um, lower concentrations. But when I tried to scale up, that was not going to work anymore, especially for um, this propargyl amide, where I started to see it actually crash out um, at higher concentrations. And so, this is just a testimony to um, how important it is to look at the solubility, not if it's just standing um, just solo in um, a tube, but being able to actually mix those together and make sure that they still stay in solution um, as it is important to be able to push those reactions. And so because of that, I knew that I could not have any trace of the DMF for the reaction if I was going to do this at large scale on um, the Liberty Blue. And so I was able to add the DIA NEAT. It is an access. Um, so 
uh, we were able to still get the reaction to proceed, even though it wasn't 100% um, soluble in DMSO. All right, um, so moving forward, um, we did decide to take those um, five more peptides that were able to get um, good crew purities after installation of the unnatural building block and wanted to push those forward to try click chemistry at uh, room temperature. And so uh, we introduced the copper and base with uh, the corresponding click partners um, and we allow for that to go overnight at room temperature. And in all cases, whether it was an azide or an alkyne, whether it was on the end terminus in the middle, we were able to get our desired click chemistry in high um, crew purities, where the main um, the main product that we seen was our um, desired clicked product. So that was very exciting to see um, that we were able to do so. It was um, overnight. There may be some room for further optimization, so that's definitely something um, to keep on the radar. But this is definitely a good start that uh, we know that we have access to these click products um, and we're able to do this in um, a library setting. All right. Um, so the next step I wanted to do was think about doing click chemistry on the Liberty. And so kind of taking uh, what I seen with the Multipep, um, I was able to do this at 16 hours. So I'm just using a uh, microwave conversion table um, to kind of help me decide where I wanted to start in terms of conditions and temperature for um, doing it on the Liberty microwave. And so um, this was done for 16 hours and I decided that I wasn't sure how stable um, the the compounds were to heat, so I didn't want to go cranking it up to necessarily 90 degrees. Um, so I decided to stick with a 50 degree increase from room temperature, and that leads me into doing a 30 minute coupling um, or click chemistry. And so that is where I decided to start, um, and I was able to do this on the Liberty um, and was able to do this uh, these conditions 75 degrees, 30 minutes. And just took a few of those. I took the peptides that contain the unnatural building blocks in the middle of the sequence, and I was able to get our desired product in high crew purity um, in all cases where a quick 30 minute reaction were able to get to these um, products. And so this is that same peptide that we've seen before, um, the azide containing peptide. This is that product after click chemistry, and this is just a trace. And we're able to get access to this peptide and the click product at 86% crew purity in under two hours. So um, 30 minutes, um, that's pretty fast to be able to get to these products and it may still be worth to um, think about other methods um, and can we get this reaction to even go faster um, so there's definitely still room for improvement but this is definitely a good start that uh, we can perform this click chemistry um, at elevated temperature in as little as 30 minutes and so we'll wrap up with some conclusions in uh, future directions and so in conclusion, uh, we are able to incorporate azides and alkyne containing monomers, both at room temperature and elevated temperature, taking advantage of our automated systems. We were able to get access to click chemistry products um, at room temperature overnight. And we also were able to achieve this at elevated temperatures in as little as 30 minutes. And so um, the placement of azide versus alkyne in the actual location of click chemistry seems to have little effect on the crude purity, um, which is really great because it tells you how um, versatile that this chemistry has the potential to be um, when thinking about it doing it on automated systems. And so what do we want to do next? Uh, we're definitely not done with click chemistry. We're definitely just getting started. Um, as I kind of talked um, throughout, um, there are areas of further optimization um, that can happen. So we definitely want to keep that um, in mind. In terms of macrocyclization, I think that that would be a really cool area to explore where we have our azide and your alkyne on the same peptide and being able to do that cyclization would uh, be very crucial as we've 
talked about and shown how um, having those stable products um, can be beneficial for downstream um, therapeutical um, applications. And um, everything that we've I talked about today with copper um, based click chemistry. And so I think it will be really cool to um, look at strain promoted click chemistry, um, maybe taking advantage of small molecules such as this um, where there's biotin and we have that um, DBCO um, group on there to be able to have that strain um, push the click chemistry without that catalyst required. And so, um, just in general, looking forward, um, I think that it's going to just continue to be very important to increase um, the amount of peptide modifications. Automation of that is just going to help um, out with that process. And it's just as we are continuing to look at peptide modifications, um, it's going to just um, see and we'll see in terms of our um, the therapeutics out in the world um, as this will start to continue, we'll continue to see peptides um, grow in the field of therapeutics and peptide modifications are going to be really important uh, to see that market grow. And so I want to thank you all for your attention uh, today. A very special thank you for uh, to Iris Biotech for the opportunity. Um, and again, I highlighted or there were um, reagents that were used um, from Iris Biotech and I can definitely test them, um, be a testimony to uh, their reagents being very high um, quality. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity today and I'll be happy um, to take any um, questions. Yeah, thank you so much Quibria for sharing those comprehensive studies and data with us. Uh, yeah, during this talk, we collected quite some questions. So the first one came in uh, during those peptides with the hindered amino acids in the sequence. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a very high purity with the AIB, AIB peptide, but a mm -hmm. rather low, or comparatively lower with the N-methylalanine AIB. Did you identify what were the impurities that were coming up with this N-methylalanine? Yeah, so um, the majority of what you see is usually a deletion. So it's just isn't incorporated into the peptide um, chain. Okay. So um, that's usually how you can tell if the reaction is pushing. There's no sort of side reactions that um, are occurring. It either couples on or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So the next question coming in during the uh, peptide synthesis. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, do the primary amines and resin bound bromoacetic acids not lead to cross-linking via tertiary amines? And in, in principle, that, that's also true for the click reaction. Do you sometimes also have click reactions between different peptide growing chains or do you all, always only have them say intramolecularly not leading to yeah cross linking between different peptide chains? Um with the data that I've seen so far I have not seen any um uh, cross linking um the major uh sort of byproduct that you see um, is usually just starting material before the click occurs, but I don't, I haven't been seeing any cross-linking. But with, with the peptoids, it would be probably the same. Um, mm. Of course, it, it, it is somehow a, a question of, of the density of peptides and, and, and of the loading on the resin, I guess. Right. Okay, so the next question, are the clicked products, so the triosols, are they stable? Um, that's a good question. Um, so far, um, they seem to be pretty stable. So we've had peptide um, solutions that have been sitting for a few months and gone back to analyze those used um, those on UPLC, and they have the same crude purity that they did a few months ago. Um, so that's just in storage of water and acetonitrile. Um, so far, um, but that seems pretty promising um, that they're able to at least stay at room temperature um, for a few months. 
OK, and the question in a similar similar direction. Um, do you have to do the click reaction after the completion of, of peptide synthesis or can one perform the click reaction right after the incorporation of the monomers and then continue with peptide synthesis? Um, that's a good question. So um, we have not tested in terms of the order of operation. I think that the one thing that you'll want to consider is what is on to the molecule that you just clicked. Can that molecule react with other things within um, the peptide? Uh, and like, could it react with any reagents that you're using for click or for coupling or deprotection. Um, if it's a functional group that is orthogonal to those conditions, then I, I don't see any problem with you doing the click chemistry in the middle of the synthesis. But you will, if you are concerned about it re, those, that reacting with something um, with those conditions, I would just recommend doing it at the end of the synthesis. I think that's probably the safest um, time to do it. OK, so one visitor saw that uh, some of the or many of the peptides were acetylated, especially that one with the proline at the end terminus. So they were uh, acetylated at the end terminus. Um, is this necessary having that end terminus kept? Because for some applications it may not be desired. Uh, is it required to acetylate the end terminus to do the modifications on solid support, or is the, has did that have different reasons? Um, good question. So um, in some of the cases where we were, we just wasn't sure um, if the N-terminus could potentially react or um, coordinate with any um, sort of free agents that we're adding. I think the, the safest bet um, was to acetylate. Um, I don't think we have the data point to say um, if it is can you do the like so far like with click chemistry i've been doing acetylated peptides i haven't i haven't done the variable where the N-terminus was not acetylated um but one thing to keep in mind if you are you know concerned that um your um your i guess peptide modification could interact with your N-terminus and you do not want to have an acetylated cap you can take advantage of a Bach amino acid at the N-terminus so then you have an orthogonal sort of protecting group that can stay on um, while you're doing your peptide modification um, but then when you do your uh, final cleavage off of solid support and workup you're able to deprotect that N-terminus so then you have access to that for your applications after um, workup. So yeah. Um, yeah, we don't have that data point, yeah. but um, you de there is definitely ways around um, being able to do modifications and still get your N-terminus free after. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now the question to the biotinylation. Once biotin is clicked to the peptide, mm -hmm. um, are there difficulties in dissolving the biotinylated uh, peptide after cleavage? Because it's often there's the solubility issues with biotin? Um, so I did not see any issues um, on the, the workup side of things. So again, it is, uh, we talked about solubility of the, the small molecule, but um, after the peptide has that on there and after workup, I didn't have any issues with um, either precipitation of the peptide, um, putting them into solution. Normally when I'm solvating peptides, I take advantage of not only just water, but also acetonitrile. So having mixtures of that was really, um, important to be able to dissolve those peptides, um, but nothing um, special needed to be added to the solutions um, to put um, to be able to have access to those peptides. OK, so another question to biotin. Uh, when cleaving biotin propargyl, I mean click conjugates from the mm -hmm. resin with concentrated TFA, mm -hmm. do you see any degradation of the final product when using concentrated TFA? No. I did not see any at all. Um, and that has been pretty consistent with um, not even just click chemistry, any um, um, peptides that I've been working with with biotin, even regular side chains, they've been pretty um, they've been pretty stable in the context of acid. Um, this is with 
slightly elevated um, cleavage conditions as well as room temperature for um, about an hour. I can't say for elongated cleavages saying like four hours, like let's say you have a bunch of arginines on your peptide. I can't give note to that, but using pretty standard uh, cleavage conditions the biotin seems to be pretty stable. Okay, and what about the stability of the acide groups? So uh, do you see sometimes reductions of acides during cleavage? Um, that is a good question. So I have seen in literature um, as that could be a potential thing to happen, but I have not observed that um, so far. Okay. Are there size limitation on what molecules can be clicked uh, to the peptide using this chemistry? Um, not exactly sure. Um, I was able to, at least for the two click partners I had, I had a pretty long um, click partner where it had like a lot of pegs on there. Um, that seemed to work fine. And then we had our smaller paparjolamide as our click partner, and we were able to click that on there. Um, so I think that there is a potential to be able to put um, pretty bulky things. I think that what's really going to be the test is when we start diving into copper-free click chemistry and take advantage of strain promoted. Um, click chemistry, I would love to see if those like more bulky things um, could um, cause an issue. But so far, we have not seen um, any issues with at least long um, click partners. Okay, uh, so one very special question. What's the best condition for stapling by using Grubbs Catalyst on microwave? Yeah, um, so in terms of actual conditions to do so, um, I believe that what the conditions that we used were about 10 um, micromole of uh, rubs catalyst in um, the solvent system we used was DCE. Um, and we were able to get to those products. Um, I believe we did, um, let me actually, yeah, so we were able to do those uh, two times at um, 40 degrees, like a double um, reaction. Okay, so um, there is only one question left, I okay. guess, as far as I can see. Um, would you be willing to share the slides with the audience? <laughs> so. Um, yeah, um, so okay. my email is here on the slides. Definitely feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions after this. Um, um, interested in any of the application notes that are associated with some of these peptide modifications, um, you can definitely reach out directly to me and I'll be happy to share any um, more details about some of that chemistry. Okay, so. As far as I can see, there are no further questions. So, Quibria, thanks again. It was a great pleasure to have you as our guest speaker. So, as I do not see any further questions within the chat, just again, if you have any questions left, you can contact us directly also afterwards, and we can also forward the questions to Quibria. With this, we would like to close our online workshop. As a follow-up, we will provide the recordings of this workshop on our webpage. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks to all our speakers and also a big thank you to our QA manager, Klaus Helm, for taking care of the technical support. We hope you could collect some helpful ideas and information from this workshop and you can gain some interesting own experiences with this elegant technology. We are looking forward to meeting you in the next workshop in March 2024, which will be announced on time on our homepage and via social media. Enjoy a beautiful holiday season, stay healthy, and hopefully see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>